Today's episode is sponsored by Dr. Janine Janot. Dr. Janine Janot is the author of one of my favorite books, The Disintegrating Student, Super Smart, and Fallen Apart, a book about why we're trying harder than ever as parents, but our kids are doing worse than ever. She discusses the pressures our students are under and how we as parents can help alleviate that stress and become more connected with our children without stressing ourselves out. She's a student and parent coach, so she knows a lot on the subject as she sees it every day. She offers one-on-one parent and education coaching for you or your child and has a free newsletter that is always full of cutting-edge information and insight regarding the latest in parenting struggles. To buy her book, book her for coaching sessions, or join her newsletter, go to www.janinejanot.com. That's spelled J-E-A-N-N-I-N-E-J-A-N-N-O-T. Okay, today's topic is the self-driven child. I am so excited about this one. Dr. William Stixrud is the co-author of one of my favorite parenting books of all time, The Self-Driven Child, The Science and Sense of Giving Your Kids More Control Over Their Lives. His and Ned Johnson's book is fantastic cover to cover, and so was this conversation. Dr. Stixrud shares real science to convince me, and hopefully you, that there are so many areas of parenting where we are unnecessarily stressing ourselves out. Hopefully, at the end of this talk, you feel relieved and ready to give your child more trust and autonomy over their own lives. I hope you listen, and I hope you enjoy it. Go, Mommy! Go! The best mom ever. You are the best mom ever. I saw it really in my career how just how quickly kids matured, how beautifully matured when they are trusted to make decisions. So, right. That's scary as a parent, though, to make that leap. And I think that's one of the main things I want to talk to you about is to create a conversation that helps give parents the courage to yeah. make that leap. Yeah. yeah. Um, because if you're just kind of told, ah, oh, take, you know, see what happens, <laughs> you know, it's, no, it, it, it's true. And th- th- that's why, um, that's why there's so much science in the book. You know, I, I wanted people to understand that it's my, my main motivation, Cindy was helping parents understand that it's safe not to be on top of their kids all the time and not to worry about their kids all the time. And there's so much science that supports this approach, as, as well as you know my 40 years of working with kids and raising two wonderful adults uh, and, um, and to kind of walk in this walk. And also just you know, 40 years of, of working with families and seeing how this stuff plays out. Um, I just want people to understand that it's safe, that it actually you're aligning your thinking with the reality that if you can't really make your kid do anything, which you really can't, then it couldn't be your responsibility to see that they turn out a specific way. And in fact, it's so gratifying when we start to to shift our perspective and think our job is to help our kids figure out who they want to be and how to get, how to get there. It's, it's definitely very liberating. um, Once you really accept it to be true and that you really are making a good parenting decision by doing that, there's just so many other messages that I don't know how (laughs) we ended up being sent. I mean, as a parent of a 12 year old, I feel like my generation of parents are really in the heart of being told we're responsible for everything these humans become. Right. Right. And it becomes a failure failure on our part if our kids don't get into good schools if they make any mistakes um right. along the way so i guess i'll i you know want you to say one more time really clearly like can we make our children more successful is it how much control do we have over pushing them, encouraging them, molding them, whatever the word is that I often hear into being better humans than they were going to be without that pushing. Yeah. yeah. So we're just, Ned and I are working on a second book on uh, communicating with kids. And 
um, we just we just finished a chapter on expectations, and it turns out that the parental expectations are hugely related to kids' academic achievement, much more than any kind of other parental behavior, including monitoring their homework. But the, the way the way parental de, de, um, expectations are defined are is, is confidence that a kid can do well, as opposed to you must do well. And I think mm-hmm. that's really we, we talk in this chapter about healthy versus toxic expectations. And from my point of view, it's healthy. To, the healthiest thing is to realize that we don't really know always know what's right for a kid. We don't know who he wants to be. He, 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 your 12-year-old doesn't know either, but that's really his job to figure out. And if it's, if it's true, and, and I, I defy anybody to, 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 to <laughs> prove this, that you really can't make somebody do something against their will, then it theoretically couldn't be a parent's responsibility to make their kid do their homework or make their kid work harder to do well in school. And also, I'll say that for me, the thing that seems so crazy to me was in 1990, I, I was presented uh, at a conference of, of, of all the um, state of Maryland universities. And I was talking, after I, after I presented, I was talking to a professor from a local community college. And I said, what does it take to get into the community college? And he said, nothing really, it's, it's, it's open enrollment. I said, well, what happens if kids like finish two years there? What, what happens? Well, they, they get automatic uh, enrollment at the University of Maryland. And I said, well, when they, they get out of the University of Maryland, do the, does that does the degree say they started at community college? No, it's just a regular University of Maryland degree. And I realized that all this suffering, all, all this crazy, crazy suffering about how important it is to go to the most elite college possible, it's just, it's not true. I mean, we, we know on the one hand that, um, that your high school record doesn't follow you the rest of your life because you can go to community college and then after 30 credits, uh, th- that you can apply to virtually any, almost all the colleges in the country, and they don't want to see your high school transcript. We also know that the kids who go to the most elite schools are not more successful or more happy or more fulfilled or make more money than people go to less elite schools. So for me, that when you look at the, the, the level of suffering that mm-hmm. occurs for parents and their children, based on this idea that the most important outcome of adolescence is going to the most elite college possible, it's just there's something really wrong with this picture. Yeah, it, it's and it, the pressure and like you said, the pressure cooker in a lot of homes is immense. Um, and it it really all when you think about why are you you know pushing your child to be in the in the gifted program at school in third grade? Why are you pushing for good um, standardized test scores? All of it leads up to exactly what you're kind of debunking, which because you just think if they don't start the dominoes. Here and the dominoes just keep getting moved further and further back. Um, yeah. Then they won't get into these. That's what it all is really down to: is getting into these good schools. Well, it's and, true, and, and, and I, I want kids to do as well as they can, as well as they want to do. I want kids to be as successful as they want to be, but I also want them to have a healthy brain. And if you grow up chronically stressed and chronically tired, it's bad for your brain. It's bad, for, it, 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 and especially for teenagers who, as the, as the brain scientists say, they're sculpting their adult brain because they're, they're shaping the way that the adult brain is going to be formed and, and circuits that they use during adolescence become part of the, of the adult brain. Circuits that they don't use basically die away. And, and so we don't want adolescents to be sculpting brains that are just used to being tired and anxious and stressed because it just puts them at higher risk as they get older for recurrent anxiety or depression um, and for, from my point of view, m- many of the families I work with you know, who are lovely, I mean, I, they're lovely people. And my clients are just fantastic. And many of them, and certainly many of the kids, seem to think that if they get into a really good college, all the suffering will have been worth it. Mm-hmm. And my feeling is it's not. It's not because if you, if, you, if you have to go through tremendous sleep deprivation, lots of anxiety, it changes the brain in a way that makes you more vulnerable for having mental health problems the rest of your life. And it's just, and, and, and certainly I see, and, and my co-author Ned sees lots of people who are extremely successful, extremely wealthy, and they don't enjoy their success because yeah. they're, they're, they're just, they're anxious or they're depressed. 
Yeah, I don't think we talk about that enough, um, you know, just at what cost. And I really liked, I think it was really helpful for me in the book where you highlighted the sort of what you think of as typically um, kid to be concerned about. And it was that he's in, you know, a school where he has to worry about violence on his way to school. Um, You know, he's doesn't get three meals a day. Um, That kid's brain didn't look very different or different at all from the kid who goes to an elite private school um, and feels a lot of pressure to keep up and to get into a good school. Um, Do you know, remember what I'm talking about in the book? Yeah, it is very, very, very early in the book, maybe even in the the introduction. Uh, But uh, yeah, it's just, so the idea is that people have studied the effects of poverty on the brain. And, and they're ugly. And, but also the effects of chronic stress and, and, and pressure and workaholism and sleep deprivation that many you know, middle class, upper middle class kids experience you know, is, is bad for the brain as well. And so in, in terms of the stress systems, that there's a lot of similarities in, in these kids who, who grow up in these god awful schools with, with violence filled communities and these kids in very affluent communities. In fact, um, there's a, there's a whole body of research that we talk about in the book that they didn't, that, that really see, sees kids uh, of affluent parents in high achieving schools as being a separate risk factor. And the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation re- really re- recently published a study where they, they, li- they listed the factors that create mental health problems, that contribute to mental health problems uh, in teenagers. And it's poverty, discrimination, trauma, and excessive pressure to excel. So, so you, that's pretty bad company to be keeping. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think that if we really think about, we want kids to have healthy brains. We don't want them to be sculpting workaholic brains or perfectionistic brains. And we don't want them to be tired all the time And because t- being tired is, is, does the same thing to your brain and body as being highly stressed. And we want- I agree 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you think about that, that those pressures- are right up there with what's harmful for kids as the things that you sort of consider obviously harmful. You that isn't, you know, it really it really gives you permission. I think at that point to say this isn't how we're going to do this. And when you when you ask, you know, why why the good school why all of this and it's usually boils down to uh, why I want options for my child because we think of choice as being. Um, what makes us happy. And it's so funny because they're spot on about the fact that, yeah, having choices is a contributing factor to happiness, but they're just going about it all the wrong way because you're giving your child no choices. Well, yeah. And and so, so for me, um, I was, I was a C plus student in high school and I did just a well, just well enough to get into the university of Washington and I got school. I got serious about school later, and, and I got a PhD. I did my, my internship at, at, at uh, one of the Harvard Medical School hospitals, um, and and I I, I think that um, it's not that there's it's not that there's not some advantages to going to lead schools. The toxic message is that it's necessary, in my opinion. That that, that that's the, that's the message that if if ninety nine percent of the population isn't going to go, go, go to an elite college. It's a toxic message, say, that to be successful, you have to, because it's pretty discouraging for the rest of the 99%. <laughs> and also, you know, one, one of the, the bodies of research, that, that, that one of the studies that, that was really important in, in, in our thinking uh, was a study by this Princeton uh, economist who had looked at, uh, compared uh, graduates from Ivy League colleges to, to less elite colleges and found that they, they were more successful and made more money, had more career success. And then what they did, the second follow-up study is they, they compared people who had gotten into Ivy League schools but chosen not to go for financial reasons or whatever, and people who actually graduated, and they were equally successful. So it wasn't where they went to college. It was really who they were. And people who are bright and motivated, you know, they're, going to do, they're going to do pretty well. Uh, but it didn't really matter where they went to college. And there's other set of research we talk about in the book, other studies that find that in terms of income, career success, job satisfaction, satisfaction with your personal life, personal happiness, it just seems to make no difference. What does make a difference is what you do in college. So if kids 
have an internship and they apply what they learn, or they have a, they, they make it uh, they make a relationship with a with a with a professor who really who likes them as has confidence in them, that that makes a difference. But where you go seems to make very little difference. And so the idea that where you go is the most important outcome of adolescence, mm -hmm. in my opinion, is a toxic idea. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. And I, I you've mentioned about um, the fact that maybe you weren't an A plus student, and um, I think it is also uh, a, a chance to give a shout out to the late bloomers out there. <laughs> or I, I also know that you've mentioned several times in the book about we have to stop thinking of life, success, and happiness as this straight and narrow path um, that should be determined at. 18 years old or even younger than that, that it's okay to go to dead ends or change career paths. Um, these sort of not, you know, just straight trajectory stories are most people's stories. That's exactly right. And, and, and kids, because we have this idea that the path to become successful, kids grow up with this idea that the path to becoming successful is so incredibly narrow that if I slip, slip off the path at all, it's disaster. I'll never get back on. And it's just not, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's just not true. And, and <laughs> I, I didn't know I was going to be a psychologist, Cindy, until I was 30. And and I didn't start I didn't start my career as a neuropsychologist until I was 34, and nobody once I knew something was helpful to people nobody cared and nobody ever asked me what, what did you why, why you most people start to drink and nobody cared and, and I, I did other, I failed at other, I tried teaching I, I was a terrible teacher right? you know and I, I I tried graduate school in English and I flunked out you know I, I tried so, and just so many so many people I I just because I tell I talk about this kind of stuff. I'm, people are constantly telling me about themselves or their brother or their nephew who took some kind of circuitous route to being having a successful life and a, a fulfilling life. And yeah, it's, and certainly we, we know that that the prefrontal cortex, which is so huge in becoming successful, is not fully mature. The, the cognitive functions aren't fully mature until age 26 plus minus three. And the emotional regulation functions aren't fully mature until 32 plus minus three. Um, and, and, and so th th knowing that, just I, I, I've, I've known this for a long time, and it just, it just makes me so much more at ease when if kids haven't found their way yet. Because, because as you said, the world is full of late bloomers who took time to figure things out or, or needed, needed more brain maturation to figure out who they wanted to be and how to make their life work. Definitely. And I, there's another book called range. I don't know if you've ever read that, but I love that it, it started as a journey for like a sports writer to figure out what was the recipe to athletic success. Um, and he was trying to find the common story. Basically he was like, I'm trying to figure out like what is the most common and that, that would be then the best way to become a professional athlete. Yeah, yeah. And he couldn't, find one basically it was all over the map all different backgrounds that they grew up in um some started really early he said most started late um and picked up the sport much later in life mm -hmm. and uh that there wasn't there was not in the end he determined there was there's no one way and in fact what seemed like the only common denominator was doing various different things got you further in the long run yeah yeah. Um, you know, you can take like a Tiger Woods story, you know, but that's actually an outlier. Um, and most commonly they played other sports as well or were really interested in other things. Um, and then later th and that those things, you know, martial arts would help contribute to an NFL player's ability that's, to do yes. what he does well. So sort of dabbling as we think of it, you know, or wasting time well, <laughs> um, turned out to be kind of important and okay well that that certainly rings true to me and uh, todd rose recently wrote a book called the end of average um and it start, starts out by talking about how cockpits in in um, fighter planes and during world war ii were initially designed to kind of to, to, to accommodate the average size person 
but <laughs> we just meant that it was, that, it was, that the things were too far away or too too close for most <laughs> of the people. You know, they, they had to go to more individualized design. And I think hmm. the idea that there's one right way to do this to do do life is just nuts. I mean, I, I, what, what, there's a lovely, lovely guy that I tested. Um, I'm, not, I'm a neuropsychologist and I test kids and, 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 and teenagers and young adults for a living. And several years ago, I tested this lovely guy um, who was a freshman, um, he's a freshman at Yale. And one of my colleagues had evaluated him like four years before and found get, get diagnosed with like a mild ADHD. So it said there's a little bit of anxiety, but wasn't diagnosable with an anxiety disorder. He goes to Yale. And the first week, the president of Yale gives a talk to the incoming freshman about how what a, what a responsibility it is to go to Yale because the you know, Yale yeah, graduates go on to do such great thing in the, in the world. This this guy didn't sleep that night, and he didn't sleep the rest of the four years without trazodone, without sleep medication. He also had to go on antidepressants. And I recently heard for, and he, he graduated from from Yale and took took a job um, uh, in some kind of finance job. And I recently heard from him that he's he's uh, becoming a rabbi. And, you know, and, and the thing is, you know, he didn't have to go through that. He didn't have to have the pressure of Yale and the pressure right. of that responsibility and, and changing the brain in a way where he couldn't sleep and he, and he felt depressed and hugely anxious to be a rabbi. And, and th- thank God he's, he's finding a path that, that, that's really fulfilling to him. He's a lovely guy. But I, I think he'll be a really great rabbi. Um, yeah, but, yeah, I think that's really great, actually. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, I do too. And, and yeah, but, but you know, it's. I think if we had a little bit more recognition, as you're saying, just how how diverse life is, and how complicated it is, and how long it is. And the, uh, there's, I mean, I, the, the, for a while, I knew four Yale graduates, and one one was an English teacher and, t- and tennis coach, really good one. Um, but, and what one was a real estate agent, and one was going back to graduate school in psychology um, af- after un- unfulfilled career in the in computer mm. computer field. And the fourth one was a guy who had also went to Yale Law School, got into a really good law firm, and hated his life. You know, he's a lovely guy, yeah. but he hated his life because he had he had all the kids in private schools and all these responsibilities, mm-hmm. um, and he felt kind of trapped in this law job that he hated. And so I just think it's complicated. And certainly I, it's not, I, I want to be clear, you know, if kids want to go to Ivy League schools and they, and they, they get their work done reasonably hard and they, they don't have to really endanger themselves to do it, go for it. It's not like there's not some advantages to it. It's just that it's not necessary. Well, yeah, and I think the distinction that you're making is if the kids want to do that. Um, the drive really has to start and end with them. And you're more, you kept, um, using the term, not um, co- consultant. Yeah, um, that you're their consultant, and so if that is a goal that they have, you can give them advice. You know, help help when asked. <laughs> but giving that choice and autonomy back to them much earlier than I think we f- currently feel comfortable doing. Um, is what's important. And the guy who went to Yale and became a rapper, like I'm sure those experiences of no sleep contribute to perhaps the lyrics that he creates. Oh, no, I'm, and, sorry. I'm sorry. He became a ra- He's becoming a rabbi. Oh, I thought you said rapper. <laughs> a, a rabbi. <laughs> oh, my, sorry, my hearing must have been off. I thought that, I mean, either way, really yeah. interesting transition. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it contributes to his work as a rabbi. Well, I, either I, I way. think it gives him great compassion for, for you know, that people, for, for people suffering. And I think that, uh, and I just see it as part of his path, you know, but, but, mm-hmm. uh, and, but this idea of consult, you know, I, I in 1986, I um, I wrote a couple of papers on um, homework, and I discovered for the first time that homework didn't contribute to learning, at least in elementary school kids. And I was I was shocked because so many of the parents that, that I, I see, and I see I, again, I see mainly kids who have learning disabilities or ADHD or anxiety, said like like homework time is like World War Three, you know. And I and, the, and I said, well, what, what's all this fighting about? 
And I saw, I'd, I'd see so many kids um, who underachievers. And I'd say, if you don't turn in an assignment, who's most upset? And they invariably said my mom. So I'd say, who's next most upset? My dad. Who's next most upset? My teacher. Then my tutor. Then my therapist. You know, and, and the kid was never on the list. And there seemed to be something terribly wrong with that idea that, that, that the adult, and it just seemed to me that if adults spend 80 units of energy trying to get a kid to work, the kid will spend 20. And if adults go up to 90, the kid will spend 10. And that's been my observation for the last 40 years. And the energy, and it doesn't change until the energy changes. And, and that, that's partly why I don't, uh, that I, I've, in, in the second chapter of the book, which is called, I love you too much to fight with you about your homework. Mm -hmm. The idea is you start to think about yourself, not as your kid's boss or the taskmaster or the homework police, but, but as, as, as your kid's a, a consultant to your kid to figure out uh, how to make his life work. So you, as you said, Cindy, you offer help rather than trying to force it down a kid's throat. You offer advice. Rather, and I mean, certainly one of the, one of the, your listeners, one of the, the, the best things you can do is rather than laying stuff on kids or, or, or telling them, that, trying to convince them or tell them a million times, say, say, I've got an idea about that. Or I've got some advice. Do you want to hear it? And just getting by it. If they say no, respect it because they probably will a little bit later. But just ask, but just so many of my, my, my clients say, well, I've told them a hundred times. I keep trying to get, get them to see. Well, stop, stop, change the energy. Because the more energy you put into that, the less he, the, the, the less likely it is that he'll see it your way. And so this well, idea that, that we, so we offer help, we offer advice. We, um, as you were saying earlier, as much as possible, we encourage kids to make their own decisions. And this is in part because decisions, good decisions, are rooted in emotion which we didn't, we, we, we've only really known this about 15, maybe 20 years now. We used to think we make our best decisions when we put our feelings beside. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that if you have damaged emotional centers in your brain, you can't decide what to have for breakfast because emotions are rooted in what do I want? What's important to me? And I want kids to have a lot of experience with these kind of processes involved in making decisions before we send them off to college. And my, so in what we say in the book, with little kids, as much as you can, say, it's your call. And it, you can start with two-year-olds in terms of, of, you want to do it this way or that way, and respecting that they may, they may prefer some things than other things. So that's part of their individuality. And as they get older, you're encouraging them to make choices about things, giving them, and give, giving them options. And eventually, by the time they're teenagers, saying, I want you to practice making decisions. And I, I personally feel that, that the best message you can give a teenager, a parent can give a teenager, besides, I'm crazy about you is I have, I have confidence in your ability to make decisions about your own life and to learn from your mistakes. And I want you to have a ton of experience doing that before I send you to college. Yes, which, which means being okay with the fact that they're then going to make mistakes, well, right? I, just, I mean, who, who, I mean what, 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 what adults among us, I mean, don't, don't make mistakes. I mean, don't, <laughs> don't make stupid decisions. You know, can we, I know, but it's like we all we tend to just separate childhood from adulthood as if they're two totally different things, right? But then people don't just magically become adults overnight. But right. it's always so interesting when I see um, activities that are designed for kids, especially activities that are designed for older kids um, and and teens that that. Um, just don't look like you're taking into account the human part of them. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? That, well, it's not that different than what you want. You know, what they want in life is the same thing that, that you want. That, that, that's, that's largely true, you know, and it is true that teenagers, um, you know, they, they can make more impulsive decisions. But in terms of making thoughtful decisions, you know, if, if, if they're willing, what we say in the book, is you want kids to make their own decisions, but we want them to make informed decisions. Meaning, if they don't know, I mean, uh, they don't know enough about a situation, they have to talk to people who uh, who know more about it and give them information and experience. Um, and, and so, uh, parents are frequently asking me, "Where should I go? If my kid want, wants to go to, to a public school. I think he should go to private school. Uh, how do I make him? How do I convince him to go to a private school?" I said, don't, don't try to convince them. Have a conversation with them. And I'll be happy to have a conversation with them. Let's think through the pros and cons. And, and, and like that, if he decides that it's not, it's going to public school isn't crazy, 
Um, and and the, our motto is go with the kid's decision unless it's crazy, <laughs> meaning <laughs> unless almost any sensible person would say that's a, that's a terrible idea because we don't know. <laughs> and part, part of the reason we don't know, Cindy, is that you know, I, I mentioned that I flunked, out, I flunked out of graduate school. I got myself, I, I was a C-plus student in high school, but as a pretty good college student, I got myself into the pop, top PhD program um, in English literature in the country at Berkeley. But I was so anxious mm-hmm. and secure that I went for tw- 20 straight weeks for two quarters without turning in a single assignment. No. And so, so I, I flunked out. And when, when, as I was flunking out, as it became clear to me, I would not be able to go back. My whole life felt it was like go, going up in smoke. Sure. And it took about a month, maybe two months for me to realize that it was the best possible thing that could have happened to me because I always felt like an imposter with other English students. I, I'm not really a literary type. I'm a pretty good, I'm a good psychologist, but I wasn't really a, a, a literary, it just wasn't me. I always felt like an imposter and it felt so liberating not to, not, not to be going down that path anymore and, 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 and to look for something I really, really loved. And so I, I was telling this story because so often the things that we think of some decision we make to make a good decision, but it turns out later to, to, to lead to stuff we didn't want and vice versa. So often what seems to be a disaster a year later or two years later or two months later, you think, oh, my God, thank God for that. So that that's why I want kids to have this experience. I don't, I don't want them to think, okay, I'll, I'll make all the decisions for you. And then you go off to college because those kids, if they don't have experience, those kids, they're, they're home by November. <laughs> you know, and and I, just, I see so many kids go off to college who, who, are, who can't handle it. And I think in part because they don't have sufficient experience running their own life. I was giving a lecture in – it was Houston or Dallas, I can't remember, um, uh, th- th- this winter. And I, I happened to mention one of the most elite schools, independent schools in Washington, D.C. And I don't remember the, why I mentioned it, but this woman came up to me afterwards and she said, I'm a family therapist or I'm a, I'm a therapist at the Menninger Clinic here in Houston, the psychiatric clinic here in Houston. And we know this independent school really well because so many of the graduates could get into Harvard or Stanford or Yale and they can't handle it emotionally. So they come here for therapy. Hmm. And th- she said to, to, to the one, they just don't have enough experience thinking this is my life, making decisions, learning from their mistakes, handling stressful situations on their own. And th- th- this is why I feel so strongly about kids are capable of so much more than we think. I mean, you, you think about the... Right. You think about these adolescents, the, the Parkland High School kids who just, um, who, how powerful, you, 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 adolescents, you think about Olympic athletes, these, these adolescents, they're so powerful, they're so much more capable of, of so much more than doing their homework and playing sports. And, and I'm all for doing homework and playing sports, but we, we think about it in such a limited way. And I think that that's partly why. We have so much mental health. We have this completely unpre- unprecedented level of anxiety, depression, loneliness, and in affluent kids, chemical use. And it, it's, it's you know, the, even in young adulthood, much higher likely if you're affluent to have a diagnosable substance use disorder than if you're if middle class. So this is why I think it's so important. We start to think, changing our thinking, treating kids respectfully, treating them as if they have a brain in their head and they want their life to work, which they do. I agree so much, and they they are just so much more wise than we give them credit for. And I think if we tap into that rather than argue with it, um, sometimes that can be a really nice discovery about your own child. Um, I know my child who's in the thralls of puberty doesn't always phrase things the proper way, (laughs) isn't always a pleasure to be around, and doesn't really love being around his parents right now. (laughs) Um, But when we can make like understand that and respect what what's going on and, and demand a certain level of respect from him also. And you just listen to him. There's so much wisdom. And and I find that with, with all kids, actually, they have a lot to teach us um, most of the time. Well, I think that's a really beautiful perspective. Um, and yeah, kids certainly, you know, kids go through the times where they're, they're, they feel less close to their parents or they want to be less close to their parents or, or more or less. But, but we're all deeply wired to, to have a relationship with our parents and, and kids virtually always <laughs> come back. And so and our, our job, is, is, I think that certainly 
we, we don't we, we want to be assertive with kids and that's part of what i, I want, want to be clear about the, the this approach that we recommend in the book this think about yourself as a consultant doesn't mean that your kid gets to be the boss of, of, of the family you know or, or gets to treat you disrespectfully right. you know, that, that you, you you i want i want you and other parents to be assertive about yourself but it's different than trying to make your kid behave in a certain way and that we, we try to use force to try to, to get kids to, to, to change. It doesn't usually work very well. And it usually works better if, if we use our relationship. And, and, and we, we, if there's something that's stressful in relationship, when things are calm, we have a conversation about it. We do collaborative problem solving to figure out how to solve the problem. Um, and um, so, and so, so, so much, I mean, especially if our kids aren't doing well, so much of our work, in, in my opinion, should be on ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, that, <laughs> I can't tell you, kids, they've told me that they got, they got in trouble. They're, 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 they got yelled at last night because they were yelling at their brother. You know, <laughs> And I think there, there, there's some irony you know, there <laughs> that, uh, that we want to model what we want to see in our kids. It, it includes treating them respectfully and, and, and t- treating ourselves respectfully. And if, if kids are treating us disrespectfully, say, you know, saying, I don't feel like being, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't let people talk to me like that. I'll see you in 15 minutes and try again. And like that, um, as opposed to, to, to lecturing them constantly about, hey, you, you can't, that's disrespectful. You, you can't talk to me like that, um, like that. And it's, so, uh, yeah. And I, I will say that the, the, the major thesis of our book, uh, Cindy, is that having a sense of control having a stronger sense of control is probably the most important thing that can happen for young people right now. That, and I say that because a sense of control and it doesn't, it's, 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 is good for everything. It's good for your physical health, your mental health. It's huge for self-motivation, it's huge for academic achievement. And th- that it, it doesn't mean that I'm supposed to control everything or I got to be the boss of everything. What it means it, it, is that I can direct my own life. The opposites mm-hmm. are things like feeling helpless or hopeless or passive or overwhelmed and anxious. And what this reflects, when, when, when we have a healthy sense of control, that, that we're, we're, we're engaged, we're motivated, we're focused, we're involved in our life, we're, we're handling things, and we aren't unduly stressed or tired. And when we're in that kind of state, our brain... Yeah is working optimally between the, because the prefrontal cortex, which can think logically, is running the rest of the brain. And, put, and, and if something stressful happens, puts things in perspective, goes into coping mode. Once we get stressed, the amygdala, the very primitive part of our brain that senses and reacts to threat, basically takes over the functioning of the brain. As, as you, you, you think when you're really highly anxious, you can't think straight because you, you aren't supposed to. You're supposed to react when you're really highly stressed. Um, and so your thinking part of your brain goes offline. And so promoting the sense of control is, is huge for kids' emotional development, their motivational development. And that's, those are the two, main, two of the main reasons we wrote the book. Because so many kids who have these stress-related anxiety problems that are related to a low sense of control. And because we see so many kids who have either low motivation or perfectionistic, obsessive motivation, and don't have that healthy self-drive that, that comes from a healthy sense of control. All right. And I, I have a little theory about mm-hmm. how we can help cultivate really all of those things. <laughs> um, and I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah. And that is through play. So um, when I'm thinking as a parent, I'm listening to this, I'm like, oh, crap, what am I supposed to be doing? Um I'm a big fan of saying how you can kill a lot of birds with one stone and helping your child develop all of these things at an early age is to let them free play. And I mean, that's behind the whole mission of the kid factory, my community project. Right. Right. We create these pop-up playgrounds where we specifically have volunteers who are trained not to teach not to lead and just to hold a safe space and to model play. Um, and we really have to remind parents, don't teach, don't help unless you're asked. Um, so do you back up 
this plan? Do you uh, no, I think believe it, play is really essential as well for all of this? No, I think it's crazy. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, um, mammals play, you know, the young mammals play and the idea, I mean, even, even maybe 10 or 12 years ago, um, I was giving a talk on play and these preschool teachers came up to me and said, you know, we, we can dress the kids up, but we, we but they, once they're dressed up for dress up play, they don't know what to do. You know, and I think that the, the, the concern that, that I think the justifiable concern is so much of kids play now is either structured play, you know, mm-hmm. soccer, soccer teams at, at age two or three, starting at age two or three or electronic play. And, and I, I think um, personally that, that you're exactly right. The, the, and there's a guy there's a guy at uh, Boston University by the name of Peter Gray. And I, I discovered him because I, I was Googling sense of control and, and various things for our first book. And, and he put together something in a really interesting way. There's a researcher by the name of Jean Twenge who, who demonstrated that young people in 2007, that, that, high, school, that high school and college age uh, young people, were five to eight times more likely to be reporting the, experience, the symptoms of anxiety disorder or depression than young people were at the height of the Great Depression, during World War II, mm-hmm. during the Cold War. And also that since 1960, there's been a dramatic decline in young people's sense of control. Peter Gray said, here, here's the connection, that the, the connection between these two things is play. That, that cl- play is the way kids develop a sense of control. And you think about it, I mean, it's certainly many, many people of my generation, and I, I'm, I'm much older than you are, but, but many people of my generation, on, on a Saturday, we, we'd go out, we'd, we'd leave the house at, at, at 8.30 and come back at dinner time, and our parents had no idea where we were. We just made this stuff up. We, 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 did what we, we did what we wanted to do. We'd make up games or build something. And people think that, that, that that's that Peter Gray and other people think that, that that dramatic play, that unstructured dramatic play is just or rough and tumble play or that kind of unstructured play is right. huge. Uh, and certainly when I, when I was in graduate school, people were, were, were studying how just watching ki- little kids do dramatic play and seeing the way that they they worked out their emotional issues. Something, a conflict that had happened or the, a fight or something, or they got in trouble for something, they work it out in play. And I think that the, the extent to which we deprive kids of, of, of play, of unstructured play, I think that to that extent, I mean, they're, they're just going to have more and more problems. And I'll just, I'll just add, Cindy, that I, I have two granddaughters. They're seven and four. And their, their parents were very, they, they have very minimal exposure to technology. Just recently, they started to be able to watch uh, like Sound of Music, uh, musicals. Uh, in COVID, it, it, in COVID, it's, it's changed. But, but all, they do, all they do is play. They, they, just, they make up games. And, and, um, and I was wondering what's going to happen now that they have distance learning, both, both in first, first grade right. and high school, the distance learning the last few months, and they're on Zoom all the time. Is that going to change their dramatic play? Still, all they want to do is right now they're, they're reading Little House in the Prairie. All they want to do is play Little House in the Prairie. Oh. And, and it's, it's just so beautiful to watch just the stuff that, 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 that they're never bored. And, and, and they just constantly are making stuff up. And we, we've known for, for research for at least 60 years that, that, that those processes involved in play are hugely important for healthy development. So kudos to you. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you agree with me. That would have been terrible if, <laughs> if my theory was yeah. all wrong. Yeah. But I know, I know because I see it and it took a minute for it to click for me. Um, how I had felt during my son's best free play years. I mean, he, he played and we did okay at that, but I, I know that in my mind I was always looking for, okay, we need to get him into swim lessons because, um, you know, he needs to be a, a good swimmer and he also needs to know how to be on a team sport. So we have to make sure he's with a team. I know that I was doing all of that calculating when he was that age. And I really hate that. Um, luckily for him, <laughs> His drive to be a nature kid, it was just in his DNA. So he very much fought against 
these all these ideas that I had about how I was going to mold and shape him. Uh -huh. He forced us back out into nature, actually. My husband and I had kind of lost sight of how much we loved nature. We grew up in rural Georgia and definitely spent a lot of time in nature. But then I guess we thought we got too old for those things. Those are child mm -hmm. things, you know? I don't know. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. forgot. And he forced us. Um, wow. He just wasn't. He was not. He was never happier than when he was in nature. So we started doing it more and more because we started seeing him happier and happier. But I really want to try and um, be a shortcut for a lot of other families who are fighting that same fight. Maybe who don't have kids who are going to, you know, insist that they have that unstructured playtime. And I think right. it's the unstructured. That's the, the real secret in that in that recipe um, that we're not teaching we're not leading. And in fact, try not to watch because you want to jump in. That's the that's one thing we always say at the playgrounds is, you know, go sit over there because when you see a conflict, we don't we don't want you to resolve it. Like in this space, you're not being judged by how your child behaves. So don't worry if they do something really crappy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they need they need to be able to follow through with that crappy thing they want to do. And they need to have a social consequence, not you swooping in saying, say you're sorry. They give a false, you know, fake apology. Um, the kid, the other kid gives a fake acceptance of that apology. Right. Uh, and right. then we just all pretend like nothing happened. It's so much more meaningful when we watch somebody do something awful to somebody else and then that kid gets ostracized and then nobody asks them to play again. And then they realize I better tone it down. And then they do. And they're embraced back into the group yeah. on a real authentic term. Um, right. That's just like the best to me. That's right. when I really can see like, oh, this is a real thing. This play is literally like the most important thing you can provide for your child. I, I, I couldn't. I mean, certainly for... for for little kids, <laughs> sleep and play. <laughs> that, that's right. <laughs> true. Yeah, play, hard, play hard and rest hard is the kind of formula <laughs> we talk about in the book, you know. And, and it's, um, but no, it, it's 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 hugely important. And there's, there's just tons of research on this, and there's there's I mean, there's no evidence at all that young kids benefit from use of technology. Somehow, it, it affects their, their their development in a positive way. And there's there's 60 years of research on how much they benefit from unstructured play. So I mean, for for me, it's just kind of a no brainer. But, but it's 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 a really, you, it really is going against the wind. I mean, the, the, and, and and it's it's based in part is certainly it's it's based largely on fear, that fear that other kids are going to get ahead of our kids. If our, mm -hmm. our other kids know how our, that kid already knows how to use YouTube, you know that that or, or that, that kid's already playing soccer. And you don't have to play soccer at Start Talker at two or three in order to be a good soccer player when you're when you're older. And the idea of rushing kids in, into structured play to, 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 to teams or relying so much on electronic play that's structured for them is just it, it, yeah. I, I think that, that it's not going to prom promote the healthy development that we want. To purchase Dr. Sticksrude's book. The Self-Driven Child, The Science and Sense of Giving Your Kids More Control Over Their Lives, or to find out more about what he's up to, go to www.sticksrude.com. That's S-T-I-X-R-U-D.com. Yay, you finished the whole episode! For more about Go Get Mom, you can visit us at thekidfactory.org slash gogetmom or follow us on Instagram at gogetmom.podcast.